وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin by praising Allah, by asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to his family and his companions. In this short course brought to you by Al-Madrasatul Umariya on the Muslim family, we are in the middle of looking at the rights of the husband and the rights of the wife. And we mentioned that some of these rights are roughly equivalent in the sense that they are broadly the same right for the husband and the same for the wife. And that those rights that have equivalence, there may be some differences. It may not be mumathara, tamma, absolute equivalence. But generally, there are some rights in which they are equivalent. There are other rights, however, which are more in the sense of being opposites to one another or contrasting rights. One has a right and the other one has a right which contrasts or or sits opposite that right. Uh, and there are rights also which are individual to the husband and the wife and might be more difficult for us to fit into particular to a particular pattern. But let's begin by talking about some of the rights which are in opposite to one another. And we have a hadith from the Prophet وسلم, which indicate this. So we have the hadith of Amr ibn al-Ahwas and the hadith is in a tirmidhi and an nasai in which he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَلَا, إِن, ألا إِنَّ لَكُمْ عَلَى نِسَائِكُمْ حَقَّ وَلِنِسَائِكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ حَقَّ فَأَمَّا حَقُّكُمْ عَلَى نِسَائِكُمْ أَلَّا يُطِئْنَ فُرُشَكُمْ مَنْ تَكْرَهُونَ وَلَا يَأْذَنَّ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ لِمَنْ تَكْرَهُونَ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, indeed, you have over your wives' rights, and your wives have rights over you. The reason I brought this hadith first of all is it shows you that contrasting, uh, or those contrasting rights, how those rights sit opposite one another. Your wives have rights over you, you have rights over them. You have rights over them, they have rights over you. As for your rights over your wives, it is that they do not allow to, 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 to sit upon your bed those whom you dislike, nor do they allow into your house those whom you dislike. And the hadith uh, continues, أَلَا وَحَقُّهُنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَن تُحْسِنُوا إِلَيْهِنَّ فِي كِسْوَتِهِنَّ وَطَعَامِهِنْ Indeed, their right over you is that you do good to them as it relates to their clothing and their food. So here we have two sets of rights. Now, this is only one hadith, and as we are going to hear, the rights are many. And it's very important that we take a principle here, that we gather together a hadith on a single topic, and we don't make any final judgments on a topic until we've seen as many of the hadith on that topic as we can gather. So it's not for a person to look at this hadith and say the only right that the husband has is that the wife doesn't let anyone into the home or doesn't let anyone sit on the bed or the sofa that he doesn't like. And the only right that the wife has over the husband is the clothing and the food. Rather, this hadith simply talks about two sets of contrasting or two sets of, if even we can say complementary rights, that sit opposite one another. So the right here of the husband is that the wife doesn't allow someone into his home that he would dislike. And that has to be understood in the context of uh, Islam and the laws and rules of Islam. But since he is the one that has provided his wife with a home, and we're going to come to that topic, inshallah, in the rights of the wife, we can talk about that, inshallah ta'ala, then it is from his right that she doesn't let people into his home in his absence that he would not like to come in. And now we're not talking about people who would be haram to come in in the first place. 
We're not talking about someone who is, for example, not a mahram or something like that. We're just talking about someone who, from among the women, from among the family members of the wife, who it would not be prohibited for that person to come in, but she knows that the husband would not like that. And it doesn't enter into the haram. It's not a matter of the haram. And so it is permissible uh, for that person to come. But since the husband doesn't like for that person to come, it's not allowed for her. One of the rights of the husband is that she doesn't let somebody into the house or let someone sit on the bed that he would not like. And that's part of obedience to the husband. It's part of his right as the one who's providing the accommodation. And likewise, uh, the kind of contrasting right with that is the husband has ihsan towards his wife. And we said ihsan is to exceed expectations and to do good and to, to you know, the best of speech, the best of manners, the best of actions. And this ihsan is with regard to her clothing and her food. And we said that the basic framework is laid out by the sharia. And the sharia lays out the framework of what is expected in terms of the basics. Food, clothing. But what kind of food and what kind of clothing that is understood. وَعَشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Live together with them according to what is customary. Each person in each different country, in each different time, each different man and each different woman will have a different set of standards as it relates to food and clothing. And what it should be is we should look at the wasat, the middle standard, the normal standard for that kind of person, for that kind of man, that kind of woman, that kind of time, that kind of country. And we can understand that the husband has to provide clothing, has to provide food for his wife. And there are further sort of definitions for that in the Sharia, which we're going to come to inshallah ta'ala in subsequent ahadith, which is that she eats from the food that he himself eats from and that he clothes her in the way that he would clothe himself. So the way that he would take care of himself and the standard that he expects for himself, at least that is the minimum that he would give to his wife as well. And we're going to come to that in a subsequent hadith inshallah ta'ala. We now come to the hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim, which again gives us a nice con sort of comparison or contrast between different rights. And that is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hajjatul Wada' in which he said, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي النِّسَاء Have taqwa of Allah with regard to your women. And we said that taqwa is one of the uh, mutual or equivalent rights which both have to have taqwa with regard to Allah Azza wa Jal for in regard to the other spouse. For indeed, فَإِنَّكُمْ أَخَذْتُمُوهُنَّ بِأَمَانِ اللَّهِ For you have taken those women in the through the care of Allah, in their responsibility given to you by Allah. وَاسْتَحْلَلْتُمْ فُرُوجَهُنَّ بِكَلِمَةِ اللَّهِ And their private parts became permissible for you by the words of Allah. وَلَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ And this is the bit that I want here. Your right over them. أَنْ لَا يُطِئْنَ فُرُشَكُمْ أَحَدًا تَكْرَهُونَ That you don't, they don't let anyone come into your room, sit on your bed, sit on your sofa, that you don't like. فَإِنْ فَعَلْنَ ذَلِكْ And if they do this, فَضْرِبُوهُنَّ ضَرْبًا غَيْرَ مُبَرِّحْ If they do this, then you can hit them in a way that doesn't leave any mark or cause any pain. Now we're going to come to the issue of a man hitting his wife in the issue of marital discord because this requires considerable explanation and time. And we don't want to get ahead of ourselves and a man to take that and to start beating his wife or for a woman to take that and misunderstand it. So we want to put that in the proper context. So we'll come to that inshallah in its proper time. But I want to come to the next part of the hadith. وَلَهُنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ رِزْقُهُنَّ وَكِسْوَتُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and they have a right over you, that you provide for them and you clothe them bil ma'roof. And we said ma'roof can mean the good actions, good statements and beautiful character. And it can also mean what is normal and what is customary. So here, the two contrasting rights, and we're not going to talk about the hitting at this moment in time, because as we said, this requires to understand it properly so that it isn't misunderstood. And we don't have people crossing the limits that are set by Allah Azza wa Jal uh, with regard to that. So we're going to talk about the two contrasting rights 
the right that the woman, she doesn't allow people into her husband's home that he would dislike and he provides for her and clothes her according to what is customary and what is known and what is good. And her not letting people into the home that he would dislike is part of what Allah Azza wa Jal said, حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ that they are, and we mentioned the ayah, we have mentioned the ayah previously, that those women guard in their husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. And one of the things that they guard is the husband's property and the husband's home. So the husband goes away and, and you know, particularly in the past, more so than today, husbands might go away for several months at a time. They may go to fight to be a part of the army, they may go for business, they may go for talabul ilm or some other reason for months at a time. And now they come back, they need to know while they're away that that house is being kept to the same standard that they would have hoped if they were to be there. And it's not the case that when the husband goes away, the wife opens the door to allow things to happen in the home that the husband would not like to happen. And in return, you get that contrast you would expect that the husband will provide both a home for his wife, he will provide clothing for his wife, and he's going to provide food for his wife. So this is an example of those contrasting rights that kind of sit opposite one another. Now we're going to come to a rather long topic where we're going to get into the details of the husband's obligation to spend upon his wife. I think this is very important because this is one of the major obligations that a husband has to spend upon his wife, what we call al-infaq or an nafaqa the right to spend, the right to provide for his wife. And it doesn't matter whether she's rich or poor. She might be very rich, but she still has the right for her husband to spend upon her. And some people misunderstand that. And they might even misunderstand it from the hadith تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْعَةُ لِأَرْبَعَةُ لِمَا لِهَا That a woman is married for one of four things, including her wealth. And they might think that that means that if a woman is wealthy, the husband doesn't have to spend, but that's not the case. Islam clearly stipulates that the right of the wife over the husband is her rizq, her ta'am, her kiswa, her clothing, her food, her provision, her home. That is the right of the wife. And it doesn't matter whether she owns homes of her own, whether she has property, whether she is very wealthy, whether she has, you know, money to buy expensive clothes. It's still her right that her husband should provide that for her. And we're going to talk about how this sits opposite rights like intimacy between the husband and the wife. Uh, so this is a very important right that the husband has to discharge this obligation and fulfill this obligation. But first of all, how do we limit this or how do we understand this in the light of the Sharia? So we're going to go through a number of different texts that relate to النفقه, the husband spending upon the wife. Allah Azza wa Jal said, لِيُنْفِقْ ذُو سَعَةٍ مِّن سَعَةِهِ وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا آتَاهُ اللَّهِ لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا مَا آتَاهَا سَيَجَعَلُ اللَّهُ بَعْدَ عُسْرٍ يُسْرًا In Surah Al-Talaq, ayah number 6 or ayah number 7, Allah Azza wa Jal said, Let the one who is wealthy spend from his wealth, and whoever's provision has been restricted, i.e. whoever is poor or not wealthy, let him spend from what Allah has given him. Allah does not burden a person Except with what he has given them, Allah will make ease after difficulty. So this ayah is a clear proof that the husband is required to spend upon the wife, whether he is rich or whether he is poor. But he is required to spend in accordance with what means he has available to him. No doubt before marriage, this is something that should be given consideration. And I don't say it should be the be all and end all or the final decision. But consideration should be given as to compatibility in terms of finances. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'ata falyatazawwaj. Or a group of young men, whoever of you is able financially, let him get married. So there should be some consideration. 
And we shouldn't be extreme in this, requiring a man to have, you know, a dunya wa ma fiha, everything in the world before he gets married. But it should be the case that proper consideration is given to make sure that the wife knows the kind of uh, ability that the husband has in terms of finances and the husband understands what his wife expects in terms of that. But it is sometimes the case that there may be compatibility when they got married. Perhaps the woman, she has a father who's wealthy and she's used to having plenty of nice things and she marries a husband who is also wealthy. But there comes a time when his wealth becomes restricted and his wealth becomes limited and he's no longer able to spend on her. So she comes to complain. We say that Allah said, Let the one who has wealth spend from his wealth. And if there comes a time when the wealth becomes restricted, then let him spend out of what he has. So there sometimes happens the man doesn't isn't as wealthy as he used to be. Let him spend out of what he has and let his wife see that he's not being stingy. He's not withholding that nafaqa from her, that spending from her. Rather, what he's doing is he's giving her according to what he has. According to what he has. And according to the ability that Allah has given him. And she should be patient and he should be patient. That inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy for them again after they were limited and restricted. So she has an she should have an expectation that her husband will spend upon her according to what he has, not only according to how she is. So we said when we talk about al urf, we talked about what is customary. It's not just about how she is, a woman like her in her place in society, in her country, but it's also about the provision that is available to him. A lot of that is decided and thought about and given consideration before marriage, but also a woman when she gets married to her husband, she understands that there might be times when finances go up and down and she should expect at a minimum that her husband will give what he has available to give. And not every time will he be able to meet the original standards that might have been set when they first got married, because money comes and money goes. And that's from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for every person. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, highlighting the importance of the nafaqa, the spending. Al-Aya. Allah Azza wa Jal said that men are qawwamun. They have qawwama. And here, the qawwama is the responsibility that the man has at the head of the family. And there's a lot of discussion that the ulama, the scholars of tafsir, have about what this qawwama means. However, here, I'm just going to, I'm not going to dwell on it as much because we can come back to it later. But we're going to talk about the Qawwama referring to the fact that the man has responsibility and authority. So in Islam, a man is the head of the household. And we're not embarrassed to say that because ultimately we are Muslim. All of us submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man being head of the household doesn't mean he'll be above his wife in Jannah. Nor does it mean that she is less as an individual in the sight of Allah than him. It simply means that Allah Azza wa Jal has organized this society with the best organization. And he has organized it such that the man, because of the characteristics that men typically have, is going to be the one who is going to be Rabbul Usra, the head of the family and the one who's managing the household. And that is the Qawwama that he has over a woman. And that doesn't mean, again, that it's an excuse to oppress her. And we're going to talk about that even at the end of the ayah. Allah Azza wa Jal said, Inna Allah kana aliyan kabira. Indeed, Allah Azza wa Jal is most high and most great. And that is intended to put fear into a, per, into a man that he would consider abusing that position that he has been given. Because ultimately, everyone will be asked about the positions of responsibility that they have been given. But Allah Azza wa Jal has given him a degree of responsibility. Because of what Allah preferred some over others, i.e. the qualities that Allah gave to the men that made them suitable for this qawwama, for this responsibility. Does that mean that every single man will necessarily embody all of those qualities? Not necessarily, because we're different between each other. But generally, 
men as a whole have been given certain qualities that make them suitable to have that authority within the household. And again, ultimately, authority belongs to Allah. He gives it to whoever he wants. He takes it from whoever he wants. And all of us exercise whatever authority we have in obedience to Allah. So no man commands his wife to do haram, nor does any woman obey her husband in that which is haram, nor does she seek to disobey Allah by disobeying him and so on and so forth, because ultimately it's our obedience to Allah that matters. But Allah has given, بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضُ Allah has preferred and Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen a man to have certain qualities. And that's a fadl, that's a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that gives, gives to whoever he wants, whenever he wants. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's not asked about what he gives. Jalla fi ula. We don't ask, no one is going to come to Allah and ask Allah Azza wa Jal, why did you give this and why did you give that? Hikmatun baligha. Infinite wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. But here, the reason we brought this ayah in this place, وَبِمَا أَنفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And the second reason that men have a degree of responsibility, that men, first of all, the qualities that men typically have, and secondly, the fact that they spend out of their wealth. So this spending is one of the two things that gives a man the ability to be the head or the right to be the head of the family and the one who is making the decisions and the one who is generally running the household. And that shows you how important him spending upon his family is, how important and how seriously he has to take that responsibility. And then the women who are righteous, who are obedient to their husbands, it can mean obedience to Allah, it can mean obedience to the husband, hafidatun lil ghayb, they guard in the husband's absence, bima hafid Allah, what Allah has commanded them to guard, and so on till the end of the ayah. And related clearly to this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put those two together is al infaq, that the husband spends upon his wife. He has certain qualities Allah Azza wa Jal gave him, and those are outside of his control. He can try to develop them like wisdom, like uh, ta'anni like uh, taking his time, uh, like al-hilm, like being uh, wise and not being quick to get angry and so on. These are qualities he can develop, he can try to work on, uh, he can try to, you know, innam al-hilmu bit-tahallum, the, the developing forbearance or forbearance comes from developing forbearance, you can, that's what, you can try to work on them. But the thing that is in his hands that he can directly influence immediately is an nafaqa him spending upon his wife. So that ayah really gives us the importance of, uh, of uh, spending, up a man spending upon his wife. And the first thing that a man is required to spend upon his wife is the mahr. And that is because Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَآتُ النِّسَاءَ صَدُقَاتِهِنَّ نِحْلَ فَإِن طِبْنَ لَكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ مِّنْهُ نَفْسًا فَكُلُوهُ حَنِيًا مَرِيئًا Allah Azza wa Jal said in the fourth ayah in Surah An-Nisa, give the women their sadukat, their mahr. And if they are happy, to spend some of it upon you, truly happy and true, you know, they give it from the goodness of their heart, from tib and nafs. Then you can you can take from it, you can eat from it, honey and mari'a with all comfort and all happiness. There is no problem in that. As for the mahr being easy, then Imam Ahmad narrated from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, an in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam annahu qal, a'zamu nisa'i barakah, ay saruhunna mu'nah. He said that the greatest of women in Barakah are those that are easiest in Mahar. So the Mahar should be something easy, but ultimately this is a right of the woman. We said it's not a condition of the Nikah contract, but it is a right of the woman, and it's from the first of her financial rights. And that's why the scholars, they say it becomes due upon either the beginning of intimacy or upon Khalwa, the first time that they are alone together in a situation that intimacy could take place, then the mahar is due. So the first of the financial rights that the husband has to take care of is going to be taking care of the mahar. If the mahar is not delimited and not specified, then she has mahar al which she has the right to the mahar of a woman who is similar to her, which is normal in the society. 
but definitely we don't want to see people in their marriage going for a mahar that is intended to break the husband because this leads to a lack of barakah and it leads to marital discord. Why? Because the husband has spent all of the money that he had. First of all, he now he can't spend upon his wife with the normal nafaqat, the normal spending. He doesn't have money to buy her clothes. He doesn't have money for nice food. He can't have, doesn't have money to do up the house because all that money went on the mahar. Then the first day they have a fight, what does he say? All my money you took, I spent my money just so I could marry you and now what do I... And the marital discord starts because he can't fulfill his normal responsibilities as a husband and because he feels resentment for all of that money that he spent. So let the mahar be yaseer, let it be easy. That doesn't mean it has to be really small, but let it be something which is easy to put barakah in the marriage and let him spend that money on clothing, on food, on the house instead of putting this big bond up that is going to cause a weight upon him and cause discord and cause a madkhal, an entrance for the shaitan. So as the Prophet said, the women with the most barakah are the ones where the mahar is the most easy. And that doesn't mean it has to be insignificant or tiny, it's up to the woman. Some women would take a mahar of for him to teach a surah from the Qur'an. There's no doubt about that. But it can still be something reasonable, but don't let this culture that there is in many countries of an extremely high mahar, which goes way above and beyond what a man can manage, and let everyone look at the man's capability, what's his salary, what can he manage, and let the wedding not be a reason for debt. Because this is wallah, the, the Prophet him, he didn't pray the janazah over some of the sahaba because they had halal debt. Halal debt, ikhwani, halal. What about the person who has burdened themselves with debt upon debt upon debt in order to get married? And all of it because of this expectation of a high mahar, a big house, buying furniture, giving gifts to everybody and relatives and whatever. And it became to the point where he got himself into debt. And now for the whole many, many years of his life, he's paying off a debt that he took in order to get married. There is very little barakah in this. And it is an easy way for shaitan to get between the husband and the wife. So let the families be understanding in this. Let them understand that yes, the woman has the right to the mahar. Let's not take that right away from her. Give the women their right. But make it something which is yaseer, which is easy. Make it easy for men and women to get married. And in some cultures, wallah, we made it so hard for men and women to get married. So hard for them to get married that it even led to zina happening in those societies because the mahar was so much that no man wants to get married. He, he, he's looking to do haram on the side or he's looking, if he's, if he's a person who fears Allah, to get married outside of the country to someone where the mahar is easy. And then all the women are left in the country not able to get married because of the of turning away from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And whenever we turn away from the sunnah, that's when evil happens. And it's not the women. Generally, it's their fathers and their families with their requests who are asking for a mahar which is not reasonable and which is burdensome. And then it's leading to al-fawahish, al-muharramat, al-zina, immorality, uh, evil doing, fornication, adultery, because of the fact that people are not sticking to this simple rule about keeping things reasonable and keeping things balanced and making marriage easy for people. That's what Allah made easy to mention in this, uh, in this uh, lesson or in this episode. Now we have more to talk about as it relates to a nafaqah, the right of spending upon the wife, and that is inshallah ta'ala going to come up in the next episode. That's what Allah made easy for us to mention, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Was salat was salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.